So given variability is going to exist, we live in a world that's variable. How should we plan capacity levels? Um, said a little bit more specifically, you know, how many people should we plan to hire? How many machines should we buy? This is something I'm almost certain every single one of you in your life and career after RBI will go and be asked to do. You'll have to make some sort of procurement um, or hiring decision. And usually you have to do that based on some forecast for what you're expecting. And oftentimes you can think about, okay, you've you're, um, you got a bid and they said, okay, these can do this much on average, how many of them do I need? And this is a really good example of incorporating variability into your decision-making process. So we're gonna go through this and say, you know, how many people should we hire? How many machines should we buy? Another way to think about this is how many people should we schedule um, given we have these machines? Um, and so we're going to go through this using an example. And specifically, that example um, I'm going to use is a healthcare example. So, um, as little as one extra MRI per day can generate more than an additional 200,000 in incremental revenue annually um, for many um, healthcare systems. And so, a local hospital has decided to install a new MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging machine. And the process improvement department, that's oftentimes what industrial engineers are called um, in healthcare, is tasked with scheduling patients for the MRI machine. And so as a good industrial and systems engineer, we look at the process. And so the first process is patient preparation. And so that's where you get the patient ready and that takes on average five minutes. And then you actually use the MRI machine and that takes on average 15 minutes. So that's where the person's in there, they're scanning, gathering data. And then the third step is the analysis of the MRI data. And this depends on experience, but uh, this doesn't occur um, during my machine, using my machine. So one um, key tool that we have as industrial and systems engineers is to do parallel processing. So we could, do step three, not using this really expensive uh, resource. So you can think about step one and step two. Um, and so my question for you is how many patients should you schedule in a 60 minute time slot if you have a fixed capacity of again, 60 minutes and you must see all patients. So from the previous slide on average, step one takes five minutes. On average, step two takes 15 minutes. All, you can assume all patients show up for their appointment and you have to see all patients in 60 minutes. Um, and you have the MRI machine for exactly 60 minutes and no more. So think about someone scheduling this 24 seven. There's no extra buffer in the system. Um, how many patients do you schedule? Do you schedule one patient an hour, two patients an hour, three patients an hour, four patients an hour, or five patients an hour? All right, so let's let's walk through through it. Okay, so it, it takes step one five minutes, step two um, fifteen minutes. These happen um, sequentially. So on average, I would get a person in and out on average twenty minutes. Okay, so if I'm scheduling five patients per hour, you would never catch up. You would have what in queuing theory. Lambda is greater than mu. You have more people arriving than you're ever going to process. And so that would be a system that if you really had a 24 seven operation, you'd have an infinite line out your door. So five does not uh, make sense. Similarly, four does not make sense. You would need 80 minutes um, of working time. You only have 60 minutes. So four and five are not uh, doable situations. Um, three, um, so if you had three patients on average, what would that mean? That means you have 100% average resource utilization, right? You have 60 minutes of work and on average, you have 60 minutes of slot, right? So you have 100% utilization of your resource. That's great from a resource utilization perspective, but what is going to happen um, in our system is you're gonna have lots and lots of waiting time. And in fact, you're going to have people having to wait a lot um, if there's any variability in the system. So uh, one thing to note is I said on average, step one takes five minutes. If it has any plus or minuses, um, you're going to have problems. And so I would recommend two patients um, per hour. Um, you can make the case, I'm only, no, I'm going to schedule three, but then what are you going to do is you're going to make your patients wait. 
And typically, if you've gone through the healthcare system, at least in this country, you do do a lot of waiting. And so what happens is they schedule for an eight hour slot, everything at 100% utilization, and then they stay late uh, every day. And so this is something many, many systems do. These are systems that I think um, as industrial and systems engineers, you really need to think about designing um, systems for variability. These are examples if you schedule your work at 100% utilization that you're always firefighting. And likely maybe you've had an internship or you have worked somewhere where you just feel like you can never get ahead. There's always something you have to catch up on. Those are systems likely that the utilization of your resources are at 100%. And so those are systems you don't usually like to work in. They're exhausting. Um, and so if you can plan for variability, um, plan to not have 100% utilization of your resource, that will make your system work so much smoother. Um, and so there's actually a curse of utilization and variability. So at first thought, 100% utilization of your resources may sound good, from the standpoint, your resources are being used to their maximum potential. But this leads to extremely poor service quality and typically service performance. And so average cycle time, that's the time in the system, will skyrocket as resource utilization gets closer to 100%. This is due to variability in the system. So if you had truly no variability, constant process time and constant arrivals, those are the only systems that can operate at 100% utilization. If you operate in the world, which is variable, in steady state, systems should release work at an average rate that is strictly less than the average capacity. And so what that means is if your capacity is one, that's your blue line, your release rate should always be strictly less than one. Um, and the other thing here you should note about these lines is these lines are not linear. So a linear line would just be like this. What is happening is it's like, and then all of a sudden goes way up and skyrockets. So this is a highly nonlinear function. Um, so over here, if you're at 0.999, it's like practically, you know, asymptotically going to infinity. Um, that's not good, right? So the key thing is, is that if you, you should not, if you have variability in your system, release things at utilization of 100%. But then the question is like, where should you release things? What should be your capacity planning decision? And typically a uh, rule of thumb is around 80%. Where does the 80% come from? Scientifically, it comes from these curves being nonlinear. So again, there's two things pushing us. One is we wanna utilize our resources as much as possible. The other thing is we want as little of like waiting time as possible. So they're going in both of these directions. So what you basically wanna do for a given curve, let's say we're at the green curve, you wanna get it where, okay, yeah, as I have um, my resource getting more utilized, yeah, my cycle time goes up, but it's kind of linear. So you're like, okay, I go up, but I get better resource utilization, so that's fine. What you wanna do is you wanna prevent it from doing this like much, much more than linear, this crazy part over here. So this is a function, as we learned in the previous video, a uh, function of variability. If you have higher variability, this curve shifts over, right? Um, so what you wanna do is you basically wanna find your utilization before it starts skyrocketing to the top. And so a rule of thumb is around 80%. So both for this low variability, you know, you're getting it's somewhat linear from zero to 0.8 for the green line. Right. But then once you hit for the green line past it, it's it's very nonlinear. It's going straight up to the sky. Um, and here, you know, if you were the red line, you may actually say, OK, because of my variability, I actually have to only have like 70 percent um, utilization. That would be my resource um, level. So, again, 80 percent is a rule of thumb. But I want you to kind of hopefully have some intuition of where it's being set and specifically this curve. So when you go into the world, one of the things I really, really hope you take from this class is this rule of thumb. Um, and you know, as long as you're not planning for 100% utilization, um, there's some wiggle room here. But I think it's really, really important to use 80% utilization when making equipment labor capacity planning decisions. This is something I failed to do when I was an undergrad intern, um, trying to figure out recommendations for things. So please uh, keep this in mind. If you ever need to buy something, like you buy some robots and you know the rate 
per hour, don't plan that they're going to be used 100% utilized. This might not be the fault of the robot. It might be the fact that things don't show up on time, right? So don't plan for 100% utilization. Um, and this is the kind of level that balances the need for high utilization with this reasonable work in process, WIP, or waiting time. So that's um, there. Again, it's a rule of thumb. It's influenced by variability. So if you have higher variability, you're going to have to have lower resource utilization. So just to kind of make sure that this is sticking, here's my question for you. So you oftentimes, um, if you go to someone selling something, they may say, okay, my average rate is 100 units per hour. I can make 100 units per hour. But you, you notice your, your process is medium variability. So, you know, that could be both in, you know, sometimes they can make 90 units per hour. Sometimes they can make 120. Maybe it's about the arrival from the process before it. Um, so it has some variability. And we need to, to make our, you know, forecasted demand, we need to make sure we can make on average 500 units per hour. So given those situations, how many machines do you buy? Do you buy four? Do you buy five? Do you buy six? Or do you buy seven? So here, um, you know, you should hopefully rule out automatically four, right? Four, you would never get to your planning requirement. You know, even if you had no variability, four is not good. Five is the minimum, right? So you have to have at least five to just make your planning requirement. And that's somewhat, you know, the kind of quick answer. Of course, it's five. Nope, it's not because if you assume five, then you're assuming 100% utilization of your resource. And every once in a while, that resource will be down. And guess what? You'll never get that time back. And therefore, you should not release um, your work at exactly 100% utilization. So five is incorrect because there is variability in the system. So then you could make the case um, six or seven. Both of those are reasonable. The way you would uh, figure out this is you would oftentimes maybe draw your curve and see where does it start hitting the sky. Also, it would matter how expensive is your resource. And so what is the trade-off between idle time and waiting time? And in certain industries, waiting time is really expensive. And in other situations, your resource is really expensive. So six or seven, each of them um, are doable. If you had six machines, that's an 85% um, utilization. If you had um, seven machines, that's at 71% utilization. So we must buffer with variability using inventory capacity, time, or money. Um, but we can reduce variability and therefore have less of these things. So we can have less inventory, less extra capacity, less time. Um, and so the goal should be to reduce variability. So if you don't pay to reduce variability, you will pay in one or more of the following ways. Lost throughput, wasted capacity, inflated cycle times, larger waiting lines, long lead times, poor customer service, right? So reducing variability is really impactful and you should do it. So how do you go do it? Um, there's actually a lot of ways you can think about reducing variability. Um, and a lot of these things are things that you can think about um, basically industrial and systems engineering 101. <laughs> so we will learn about pooling of resources. That one might not be so obvious. Um, why does that reduce variability? The idea there is if I have, let's say two lines or two machines, if one is over and one is under, I get to cancel them out. But if they're independently working, I don't get that benefit. So we'll see that um, in this kind of module, as well as when we study inventory theory, we'll see the impact of pooling resources to reduce variability. Um, the other things like training employees, having standard operating procedures, improving quality, those are all things hopefully you're learning in other courses in your industrial and systems engineering curriculum. Um, these are human-centered um, policies. Um, this is why standardization and like is important. Um, work design is important um, because it does reduce variability. Quality is important because again, you don't have to do leave work. Um, better forecasts of demand. So data is playing a role in one way to reduce variability. Um, augmenting or using automation. Usually machines are less variable than humans. So you may either replace a human with a machine or you could augment the human such that you have tools that they could use so that their variability goes down. Visibility into the process um, is important. Supply chain coordination, we'll talk about that in a follow on lecture, but if you can be coordinated, um, a lot of problems happen with 
bad coordination um, causes variability. And another one is uh, preventative maintenance um, can actually reduce variability. 